So, first of all, thanks a lot, everybody, for being here. I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, and I am the director of the Disruption Network Club. And I feel, first of all, to thank my wonderful collaborators, uh, that is Claudia Dorfmuller and uh, Kim Foss. We have been doing uh, this event together. So really, thanks a lot uh, also to them. And uh, just to present a bit uh, briefly what we do, we are an ongoing platform of events and research that is focused on art, uh, activism, and disruption. And uh, we also want to thank our funders, uh, the Regierender Burgme Burgemeister from Berlin, the Senatskantlei City Tax, and uh, also um, the Friedrich Eber Stiftung for their partnership. Um, then, of course, uh, the Kunst am Kreuzberg Betanien, that is our long-lasting uh, cooperation partner. Um, and so this uh, time for these uh, events, we have also a lot of other great uh, partner collaboration. Uh, the Nome Gallery, the Spectrum uh, Project Space, the Wow Holland Stiftung, the Copenhagen Center for Disaster Research, the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. And then uh, uh, I also feel to thank a lot the Free Chelsea Manning Initiative Berlin. You can see they have a table over there with a lot of great information. Uh, that is also really important right now because the appeal of Chelsea Manning will start. And this time is also signing the six years of prison for her. So, um, if you also want to hear more or uh, read about the p appeal, you can speak over there with the people of the network. And so now we enter into the deepness of our event that uh, makes sense uh, since the title, uh, Deep Cables Uncovering the Wiring of the World. And in this event, uh, uh, we are investigating the cultural, political, geographical and technological dimension of the Internet. And so we will have uh, as protagonist uh, land and undersea network cables and also a lot of great speakers. And uh, I would say, just I want to give a little uh, introduction and then I will present also the people that are on stage with me. Um, I think that's uh, just a bit of a metaphorical background. Uh, uh, one really big source of inspiration of this event has been uh, uh, the novel by Neil Stephenson in 1996 uh, that was actually suggested to me uh, by Bern Fix uh, from the Wau Holland Stiftung. And in that time, he was uh, speaking about a hacker tourist that was uh, venturing forth across the wide and wondrous space of three continents. Uh, it was really interesting novel because, uh, I mean, it was 1996, and he was already writing about the physical materiality of the cyberspace uh, and also how it is wired together. And so, in this two days event, uh, we have with us investigative journalists, researchers, hackers, uh, activists, uh, uh, engineers, uh, and uh, really a great crowd uh, of speakers that will try with us to unfold uh, the subject of the deep cables. And uh, among the various questions that we have, for example, is uh, who runs the internet? How is the internet secretly structured? In which way does it influence our political, cultural and everyday life? And also, what is the political and technological dimension of digital divides and breaks of connectivity in strategic landing sites? And another really important question that we are going to analyze now is in which way uh, uh, or how does a surveillance physically happen on the internet infrastructure? So these first uh, events that we have today with uh, Henrik Moltke and Trevor Peglin is a network exposed charting the invisible. And so we will speak about the hidden infrastructure of information technology, but also, in a sense, uh, how internet infrastructure is secretly conceived. And first I want to introduce uh, Henrik, then I will introduce Trevor, even if Trevor will speak first. <laughs> because I also wanted to say that what I found really amazing in organizing this event is that uh, it's an event about uh, internet and about networking, but it's also about a network of people. 
So when I first met Henrik, we were really discussing about the subject, and he suggested me really an interesting crowd of colleagues, and some of them are actually here today. And I understood that that is really interesting because many of the people that will speak in these two days actually know each other. And I even think that yesterday two of them went to do a secret expedition <laughs> that they will reveal as a, um, part today and tomorrow. So speaking about Henrik, Henrik Molk uh, is an investigative journalist, researcher and documentary filmmaker. And uh, his uh, most recent work uh, is in collaboration with filmmaker Laura Poitras, that was also here with us last year. And uh, his work has appeared in the New York Times, The Intercept, and at the Whitney Museum of American Art. And in 2014, he won the Danish Investigative Jour Journalism Award and was uh, nominated for the Kevlin Prize, that is the most prestigious uh, award in Danish journalism. And uh, in a sense, also, this kind of keynote really starts with uh, an investigation that uh, so Henrik uh, uh, really involved with, because in August, to, in August 2015, uh, he and the team, a, journalist of jour a team of journalists from uh, ProPublica and the New York Times um, revealed that, that there was a partnership between the National Security Agency and the telecom company at TNT. So I don't want to say much more about that because I think Henry will speak uh, in depth. But uh, this uh, kind of revelation that also is thanks to the documents of Edward Snowden um, has been also a really important source of inspiration for this first uh, keynote. And then uh, Trevor Peglin uh, um, is an artist and geographer. I already had the pleasure of uh, presenting him in 2014 at Transmedial, and so now we are here again. And uh, uh, he's uh, really an expert of the geography and the aesthetic of post-9-11 America and also the surveillance state. And uh, his work is uh, often disclosing uh, strategic sites of surveillance on land and space, uh, connecting various media, image making, sculpture, investigative journalism, writing, engineering, uh, and also new numerous other disciplines. And so this time, his presentation will actually go underwater, <laughs> and so he will trace the cable themselves, uh, also speaking about really amazing photos that he took uh, in the course of the last uh, months. So now I will leave the word to you, Trevor, and so then we will have the presentation of uh, Henrik Molte. Thank you. I feel like if, if you're the sort of Indiana Jones of, of the internet, I am Marcus Brody, the sort of nerdy librarian in the background doing all the boring work so you can go out and explore it on boats. And But anyway, that's, that's what I do. Um, I am a, an investigative journalist uh, and a researcher, and for some reason my computer is not plugged in. There we go. There we go. Great. Um, I do investigative journalism, and one of the things I've been trying to do in my work is to combine my love, which I share with Trevor and now Tatiana and a bunch of other people here, with finding the evidence needed to produce the stories that change the dialogue we have about these places. And um, it's no secret that I've really been looking forward to giving this talk because what I do is actually really boring and often people don't really want to listen to me. So now you have to, which is fantastic. And I'm going to be really geeky and show you a lot of documents and also some pictures. Um, I also want to thank Tatiana and the Disruption Network Lab and everybody else who put this together for bringing all of us together who worked on cables and some of us, uh, Andrew here, long before it was cool to be interested in internet infrastructure. Uh, Moritz back there worked on a uh, documentary with me before all this started. Uh, it's really great to have all of us together here in Berlin. Um, I also want to send a warm thanks to Laura Poitras. Um, she's, uh, I've worked with her for almost three years now, and she's a uniquely inspiring person and a wonderful human being without whom all of this wouldn't have happened. And I think we have this one thing in common. Laura actually didn't want to do hard-hitting journalism, and, and, and she got involved in the Snowden stuff because Glenn couldn't decrypt his email and, and sort of... I'm also not really a hard-hitting journalist normally. I've been a more sort of background feature documentary guy. Um, I also wanted to say before we get started, small disclaimer, 
uh, I have actually never met Snowden or until, until recently I hadn't uh, really had anything to do with him. I felt it was easier for me. My work in the beginning with Laura was to make sure that she could focus on, on making Citizen 4 while I sort of stayed in the archive and, and did the, the, the hard work with the documents, uh, understanding and explaining them and partnering with other medias uh, we, we worked with. Um, two months ago, uh, Laura finished her exhibition at uh, Whitney and I got the chance to meet Snowden. Uh, the way that he can go to the Whitney is we upload him to a robot that you see here in the picture, and uh, then he sort of wheels around the, the, um, the exhibition. Here is uh, Laura showing uh, Snowden uh, one of her works. It, it was really uh, funny and a bit tragic to see him sort of bumping into the walls because uh, it's, it's very dark in the museum and the, the robot doesn't see that well. Um, here he is on his back seeing one of the works we had to sort of we had to lift him to to get him on his back so he could see the work here am i and brenda from our team sort of trying to align the the, the camera on the snowden bot so that he could look through this uh, slit into the light box where one of his documents uh, was it was actually a really wonderful and, and heartwarming uh, warming moment to finally all of us uh, be there together um, here's Laura again with Snowden in front of. Actually, the film in the background is the one that started all Laura's problems and caused her to have to move here to Berlin so that she wouldn't have to have troubles with authority every time traveling. Uh, and here is uh, Snowden leaving <laughs> the museum. <laughs> um, anyway, after this digression, back to the talk. Uh, follow the cables. Uh, this, this motto of mine is a sort of meloprobism, uh, a slightly changed version of, uh, of course, the. Uh, the famous phrase from uh, All the President's Men, in which um, two journalists are trying to uncover this uh, huge government plot and, and at one point they're totally lost and they can't get all the pieces in the puzzle to fit together and, and, uh, and um, Robert Redford here meets uh, Deep Throat in, in a basement. He tells him to, to follow the money. Uh, for me, I haven't really had a Deep Throat. I, I've never been able to sort of reach out to Snowden and say, hey, how should I explain this? I've never done that. I've always tried to, to do this only based on the documents and focus on the documents and not participate in this whole uh, Snowden thing because I felt it was easier for me to, to, to sort of do my work without having to worry too much about him. And so uh, the thing that's helped me uncover some of these stories is always to look for the physical footprint to follow the cables. And so that's sort of my motto now after doing this for, for a couple of years. I also think this is one of the reasons why it's worked out to, for me to work with, with Laura and amazing people like Trevor and all these others is that we've, we kind of like the stories where you don't just take a USB stick and then explain what's on it. Uh, I've actually tried to contribute to each of these stories by going out into reality, finding the places. And for me, it's also easier to believe what I'm writing and, and talking about when I've actually seen and touched it. It sounds very, very banal, but few journalists actually do this. And so uh, another thing I, I sometimes dislike about trying to go into this hard journalism genre and investigative journalism is that you don't publish your B-roll. You don't talk about all the boring stuff you did that didn't lead anywhere or all the sort of things you looked at that uh, didn't make it into the story. And so you guys uh, will get that now because uh, that's actually often what I find most interesting. And it's a shame that you can't publish that. So all of this started for me uh, and I've tried to organize this talk by physical locations. Um, all of this actually started way before Snowden for me back in 2006 when I first read about um, a, a secret uh, NSA listening post inside a building in San Francisco on 611 Folsom Street where uh, an AT&T technician had found something. Um, this is a picture I took uh, of, of the building. All of these buildings that I often deal with, uh, at least a lot of them don't have windows. It's just sort of just look for the windowless buildings. There, there, there you are. Um, here's another shot of that building. Um, there is like, kind of like creepy, eerie atmosphere. Uh, several of them have like places where you can hang out, but people don't. Um, and Mark Klein, was, he was, uh, when he was a student, he studied physics, then went into history. Uh, he had a sort of sensitivity towards the bigger picture. Uh, and of course, having studied history, he, he, he'd been against the Vietnam War. Here he is in 1983. This is a picture he gave me when he was on strike with his uh, union, the, the Computer Workers Association of America, I think they're called. This is a month before AT&T, this like mega 
mega corporation was broken, uh, sorry, the, the Bell system, the, they call it Marbell, the sort of master telephone company was broken up into smaller ones, which later became AT&T. He was already sort of political about it. And, and 20 years later, here's a picture actually uh, uh, in 1999, I think, when he worked in New York. Um, he, uh, he also gave me this picture. What's interesting about this is that the, the, the building he's in here is the, the New York headquarters of AT&T, which itself is a, is a very interesting building. Uh, here's an interview with him uh, that I did. Um, AT&T was hiring. And they liked my background, so they hired me not to work on phones, but to work in their computer room. Mm -hmm. My job was to keep things going. Had a computer floor, a false floor, with you pull up the tiles and just cables under there, we would run run cables and... Which, which building was this in? 33 Thomas Street. It's one of these windowless buildings, built for nuclear war, by the way. That's why it's windowless. The same with 611 Folsom Street. That's another windowless building. So, so he worked into... This is a, a picture I found in the archive of the architect uh, who built this building in New York. Um, he, he actually worked there before moving to San Francisco and, and, and finding this room. Um, this, this picture is from just before the building was erected. You can see the building next to it is also under construction and, and happens to be the um, FBI headquarters or the federal building in New York, which also contains the, the FBI. Uh, very interesting building. He moved, uh, as you can hear in his voice, he has asthma, so he moved to California uh, and got a really nice job working uh, in Point Re no, not sorry, Point Reyes, up north of San Francisco, uh, sort of plugging in the boats so that they could get connected to the phone system. Uh, unfortunately, that, that stopped at some point when they got better technology. He moved back to San Francisco, uh, got a job in one building in Geary Street, and then in 2004, uh, bef uh, oh, sorry, 2003, he moved to the building I showed you before, the SBC building, uh, where this uh, photo is from just before he retired. And um, The office was crammed with uh, routers, and the routers, a lot of the fiber optic that came in there, went to Asia, to Japan, to Korea, to Indonesia. And it was, that was a good job. I liked it. We did troubleshooting and installing new circuits. And occasionally we get visitors from Japan who, you know, because they're at the other end of the fiber. And so um, what he found in uh, 2002, or it started in 2002 actually, um, he, um, he was working there and uh, suddenly this guy showed up and, and he got an email before he showed up saying that a guy from the NSA would come. At, at this time the NSA was something very few people knew about. It was this sort of shadow organization. Um, and uh, So this guy did come and just so happened I was at, opened the door for him and he was totally humorless and uninteresting character who clearly didn't want to speak to uh, a peon like me. So, Arrogant or, or just, just gray? Gray, you know, standoffish. So um, before he left in 2004, he made sure to get some documents because he was, you know, politically and, and uh, from a historical perspective, skeptic of the fact that there was a government facility inside a private phone company that controls the infrastructure that we all use to communicate. Um, he was also, you know, there was just so many weird things. He worked for the union. The only guy who could go into this room was a non-union person, a manager. Um, he, he even saw the room, uh, and, and here you, you see sort of a, a graphic. Um, representation of how that room worked and pictures of the door into the room. We don't actually see the room itself. Room 641A has now this sort of very, very gloomy uh, sound to it. But, but this was sort of the beginning for me and I followed this story. And, and he then hung on to his documents for a number of years, actually until he saw a story in the New York Times that was the first sort of thing that encouraged him to come forward. Uh, this was a story that the New York Times had withheld for a long time because it was just uh, too difficult, apparently, for them to publish it. Uh, and it wasn't until one of the authors threatened to publish it in a book of his that they, 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 they let the story go. 
but basically it was explaining this sort of big surveillance apparatus that was put in place after 9-11 and that was very much against the grain of normal constitutional American thinking that you need a warrant to surveil anybody. And so um, he felt encouraged by this story and decided to go out and first to an organization called Epic. They didn't really do anything about it. He met with journalists from LA Times that you know, didn't really do anything. He, he went to the EFF. They turned out to, uh, how many of you know the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation? The rest of you should know it. Um, it's a great organization that does a lot for sort of civil rights online. Um, they had a case already sort of building against AT&T and so um, he decided to, to um, start uh, coming forward and, and start a, a lawsuit against um, the NSA and the government. Um, just before the lawsuit started, journalists from Wired uh, published some of his documents without his knowing. Um, and, and this was for me so amazing to see these real documents showing what until now was just a crazy conspiracy theory, that there were actually uh, uh, government people tapping these fiber optical uh, cables inside this building uh, was amazing and, and, and I have to say this is uh, apart from the Neil Stevenson story in Wired one of the sort of best moments in their history which is otherwise often to just you know do product advertising for Silicon Valley and, and access journalism uh, no offense but, but I find that this was a really great moment for Wired to publish this here are some diagrams showing how this splitter worked and how you can see I've put a, a, an orange square around the, the, the common backbone which is the AT&T uh, part of the internet uh, basically tapping into their backbone and then sending the signal into a splitter which then makes you able to say sort of you can you can basically and Mark here can tell you a lot about this uh, how uh, optical uh, transmission works but you can basically copy the signal you'll have a signal loss but it'll still contain the data you're looking for and then you can start looking for it and find emails and, and whatever you're looking for. Uh, here's another diagram. What, you, what also came forward in 2006 was that they weren't just giving access to their own data and people using AT&T's data. They were also giving access to all the other companies that sent their data through their cables, um, which was a huge thing for me. This was just so, until now the internet had been so abstract. And so I was working at the time uh, in, in 2010 uh, on a documentary with, with Moritz that's uh, going to talk later. Uh, and in 2012, we went to visit the sort of birthplace, at least in popular parlance, of the internet, uh, a room at uh, UCLA where um, Leonard Kleinrock here and some other uh, technicians and, and, and uh, computer people uh, managed to send basically data from one router to another router in the first transmission. This wasn't TCP IP, this was pre-TCP IP, which is the internet protocol, this was uh, ARPANET, but it's still sort of the basic principle that works today. You have different computers uh, at th this time in 69. Computers were these buildings that talked different languages and were really like, uh, you know, uh, weird sensitive machines and so you needed a standardized computer between them that could transfer the data between them and so the IMP, the, the interface message processor made that possible and, and the internet today is basically the same. It's a bunch of routers on different levels that send the data around the, work, uh, around the world and, and the sort of biggest uh, routers and cables are the ones that I've been investigating for a long time and so while we were doing this, this radio documentary uh, Moritz and I found some documents online at this website called Cryptome. Again, this is one of those like, slightly conspiracist uh, websites. This is before Snowden, so, so it was sort of amazing and also a bit, you know, too much sometimes. But they had listed all the different cable sites and, and we decided uh, driving up from LA to go to one of them and, and check it out. And, and at this point it was still pretty unrealistic to imagine that you can surveil the whole internet and find anything in these huge amounts of data. Um, but I remember the, the Japanese cable that uh, Klein had talked about and so we decided to, to go out and, and check it out. Uh, here's the, a document we found uh, from Homeland Security, sort of thinking about how can we protect this infrastructure, what can we do to prevent terrorists and others from cutting off the internet. And they basically come up with, there's not much you can do because if they cut it, you know, here, uh, if, if we protect it here, well, they can go to Guam, where, where they actually speak, speak specifically about Guam, which is also the Jap Japan-US cable that, that Trevor showed you, and cut it there. And if you protect it there, they can go out in the middle of the ocean and cut it. So, so there's not that much you can do. The, the document also contains a list of all these different landing sites uh, in the US. And um, so we, we drove out to this, uh, looks like a Windows 95 screensaver place uh, near San Luis Obispo and, and found these places where the cables were connecting, uh, there are all these, these, always these manholes 
um, different companies. It was all a bit sort of mystical. And we, we were already a bit sort of paranoid from the night before having looked at these documents and sort of expecting black SUVs to come up and people to sort of jump out with assault rifles. I was at least, um, didn't really happen, but uh, we decided to walk closer even though there was lots of signs telling us not to, to uh, trespass. And uh, there was it's just a weird place with these barriers prote protecting it from someone ramming into the station. And uh, we arrive at this, uh, uh, the gate, and, and before I even had time to think, Moritz decided to go over and, and sort of uh, ring the bell. AT&T Frank here, how can I help you? Hello, this is Moritz and Henrik. We're two journalists, and we're looking for the internet. Is it in here? No, I'm afraid not. I'm sorry, <laughs> who is this? No, this is actually a secure uh, AT&T location. We, we can't really have you come in here. So, so the talk goes on a bit like this. I'm sure Maud's going to talk more about this, so I'm going to skip okay. uh, quickly uh, further. But what we didn't know at this time, sort of showing up at this place, was that I thought this place was like, this was it, this was AT&T Station. What I didn't realize was that um, actually another place we went right after would be more interesting uh, for, for, for the NSA because AT&T has another station on Hawaii where uh, it would be a lot more beneficial to tap the cable, and I think that probably goes on out there. Um, but we went to another cable station nearby owned by uh, uh, MCI, it's basically Verizon now, um, Verizon Business. And so you always see these uh, scribbles on the ground. Ingrid will tell you more about them. Uh, she's done a lot of really fantastic work tracing the sort of physical uh, uh, imprints on, on, on real world streets and buildings. Um, but you sort of can follow these and you get to a building looking like this. And this was a much more sort of professional and also um, you couldn't just talk to someone ringing the doorbell. A guy came out and gave us a business card and told us to call within the business hours. Very sort of polite and I don't remember how he looks. Um, and, and we just had this feeling there was something you know, bigger going on here. But again, uh, didn't really do that much more. We then headed out to the ocean. Uh, I'm a surfer so I was very excited to get out there. There's always for some reason surf where these things are which is great. Um, <laughs> and, and we get out to this uh, uh, location we found through these coordinates and, and find this toilet there and we're like, this is weird. Uh, and some other people pointed us to this place and, and we started looking and there was like a buzz from inside and there was power for the toilet and we're like, what's going on? And I, I, I sort of tried to figure out if there was something inside or like a, and, and of course there was nothing. But what we then realized was that the power was for a camera on top of the toilet. I know Trevor, you've also been out here. Um, and so the, the, the camera is pointing to these uh, beach manholes, which is where the, the cables are fused. And this is actually one of the places where you could really fuck things up. If you, if you find enough of these around the world and go into these manholes and cut the cables, there aren't that many places in the world you'd need to cut before the internet would seriously slow down. Um, and so it was a kind of magical trip to go out there and see these places for the first time. We eventually found the Japan-US cable going into the ocean a couple of miles up the beach uh, and it was a very beautiful day. And so I returned to, to Denmark and to my work there. Uh, I was uh, a temp on a radio show that summer uh, when Snowden came out uh, and uh, I, was, I was like, Jesus, this is too much. I'm already halfway there uh, and, and I had to be part of it. I was just, what am I gonna do? Uh, I, I saw the video Laura posted uh, few minutes after it came up, Joey Ito posted it to, to Facebook, and, and it was sort of this adrenaline kick that, that I had to be part of this, uh, and, and, and seeing Snowden talk about how he could sit at his desk on Hawaii and, and read everybody's emails, uh, I, I sort of scrambled and, and tried to, to, to sort of find a way to get in on this story, um, which wasn't easy, and, and meanwhile all these stories started came, coming out about uh, how the the internet was tapped, metadata, everything. Uh, one of the big stories that I was really interested in was about tempora. Uh, tempora turns out to not be really that big of a term in, in, in the British uh, intelligence. But uh, Guardian focused on that. It's basically like a buffer, but what's really important is this program they call Mastering the Internet, uh, which is GCHQ's cable tapping uh, program. And, and uh, the stories uh, sort of focused on how they collect everything and how they sort of save everything. And I started to find out, okay, what's going on in Denmark? And, and quickly after I found information where Wikileaks, uh, they had uh, published as part of the diplomatic cables uh, a list of sort of uh, dependencies around the world, things that the US uh, uh, 
um, Department of Interior found were important for the country to work. And, and on top of the list in Denmark, my whole con home country was this cable that I'd never even heard about. More important than the, the factory that produces insulin, which a lot of people rely on to, to basically survive around the world, in particular in, in America. Um, so I was, I, was, I was sort of starting on this story. And uh, the news media in Denmark just weren't interested. I tried to sell it to the Danish uh, broadcasting. They didn't want to do it uh, and, and, and not pay me to, they didn't want to pay me to research. And you know, these sort of nine to four, slightly lazy journalists that just want, here's the story, you know, go with it. They, they just couldn't do it. And, and meanwhile, others got there before me. The, the Süddeutsche Zeitung and NDR published a story about my cable, uh, which made me furious. Uh, and, and they didn't publish the documents. Uh, I'll, I'll return to the story later. Uh, and I have a lot of respect and love for, for I've worked with them since then. But, but it was sort of, ah, all this is going on and I'm not part of it. Uh, I started looking into the Danish uh, cable and, and sort of made some theories, didn't really get anywhere. Uh, I even got to, to visit my cable. This is where the internet leaves Denmark. Uh, here's the point on the beach. Here's, here's the building. I got in there, couldn't uh, take pictures, but I actually saw, so, these were seven uh, totally identical stations uh, in Germany, Denmark, a number of countries, and then the US. And I got into one of them and, and got to sort of even go through it. And, and they were very good at convincing me that nothing was going on in there, even though I found out later that their sort of actual hub in Denmark in, in Glostrup outside Copenhagen is inside the Danish secret police headquarters. This is actually a coincidence. And there's apparently nothing going on. Apparently, uh, at least they've managed to convince me. Um, but the cable system basically is a ring that goes from uh, Stockholm to New York and, and sort of um, it's very, very uh, known, well known and documented how the Swedish state surveils it, but Denmark, you know, it was just silent. Um, I'm just going to jump a bit forward to um, what happened in that summer and, and uh, I decided to go back to Berlin, tried to get through the Laura Portress, it was totally impossible. Uh, and I then decided to travel to Rio. And I think, meanwhile, Glenn Greenwald was trying to figure out the same things as me. Uh, here's, here's a video that Laura did, uh, extra material for Citizen Four, where uh, Glenn is trying to figure out what's, what's going on with the story. This is a few weeks after Hong Kong. So you have access to Damn, I wish I knew what this meant. Oh, I wish I could, I, is there no way to read that? That's the key, this is the, the key to this map. This is so small here. This is so, I mean, this is the program, key corporate partner with access to, I just, my dream is to find the fucking document where they define their corporate partners, like specifically. That would be the motherfucking jackpot. I know that's in here. Well, this is what I, right, exactly. Well, this is what now, you know why I'm so excited by this? Because now um, we can make it, we can make this like a, um, a motherfucking mystery. You know what I mean? It's like, what I want to do is say like, there's a U.S. corporation, telecommunications corporation, that partners with Brazilian communication companies and gives access to the NSA to those computer systems either with the fucking knowledge of the Brazilian corporation, which is a scandal in itself, or behind their back, like using the cover of this partnership. And that's going to then, it's, there's going to be a nationwide outburst until they find out which of these companies is having their traffic stolen from. It just, it, it makes it like a mystery to rivet people. A scandal is what it is. So, so I met with Glenn in Rio in October um, 2013 and convinced him that I and a team from a small Danish newspaper called Information should cover the Danish part of the archive. And, and he was instantly just sort of gut feeling, yes, do it, even though there were other big media there. We actually snatched the sort of contract with him right in front of Politiken and Balinska, two other Danish big media. And, and this is, Glenn is, has an amazing gut feeling. He was just, do it. And, and so we started and I went back to Denmark and this is the address of the Danish uh, Secret Service. Uh, and we started to work uh, with, with Laura about a month later because she was here in Berlin and I lived in Berlin. And, and, and we sort of saw the first documents. There was this magical moment when we got some documents and paper, went back to my apartment and burned them in the sink after transferring this to the special built air gap computer that people from, from uh, Computer Chaos Club helped us sort of figure out. And it was just like total spy movie. I loved it. Um, 
and, and the first story came out in Denmark in, in January. Uh, it took a while. Um, I, I wasn't, this was a great story. It was about spying against the UN uh, climate summit in Denmark, but I had already sort of set my scopes on a, on a bigger story. The problem with this story was, as the problem is with many of these cable things, it wasn't just about one country. It was about the bigger picture. Um, it was about the sort of part of the NSA that's been my focus called special source operations. As, as Trevor already mentioned, they have fantastic iconography, this eagle clasping the golden fiber uh, sort of ta uh, cables crisscrossing the world, amazing. Um, and this is what I think Glenn referred to as the sort of motherfucking jackpot. Uh, um, this is the, the, the one thing that has changed surveillance that they've managed to tap the cables. And so we knew that there was a document about Denmark being part of this. We just couldn't put the pieces together. It was very vague. It was very indistinct. It talked about this special access thing and how the Danish Secret Service worked with the Americans on cable. Uh, they, 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 they said working cable access with. Was there a word missing? It was all really weird. Um, and Denmark being part of some cyber stuff. Uh, but uh, we started in the story and it took a long time. Uh, it, it, for me, it's maybe the biggest story I've ever done, but it was very un underestimated by others as often is the case when you deal with cables. Um, this is another slide about why uh, SSO, this, this cable department of NSA is so important. Um, they deliver a lot of the stuff that, that the NSA collects uh, and they have different programs basically working together with US telecoms, with countries. The, so the second parties are uh, the UK and, and sort of in second rank uh, Australia and New Zealand and all the other Anglo-Saxon countries. And then the, th the third parties, which is countries like Denmark and Germany. And then they have hidden tabs in places they can get access to. I'm just going to skip through this a bit quickly. Another great slide, great uh, symbolism here. So Trevor already showed this. The program we were uncovering called Rampart A was very specific about how secret these collaborations are and how important. Um, and actually they're classified, it's not really classification, but they're protected above the level that Snowden had access to. So even though there's a lot of information about them in the archive, uh, who the partner is, where the access points and the processing centers, et cetera, are, and, and stuff like that is protected above the archive. And so, um, the work has really been to stitch together many small traces sort of to, uh, to get past these, they call it exceptionally compartmentalized information. That's the protection system they have. Um, the, one of the documents also said that they actually used these old Cold War listening stations as cover. So when you see these, this is the Danish one, um, actually uh, it, it, it might still be a place where they tap the internet. They were just practically already there. Um, here is the Danish uh, place. So my cover often is to go on my bicycle with my uh, Lycra and, and sort of just look like I'm you know, lost or something. So I walked into that place one day and sort of very easily got to that uh, Cold War place and went through the dumpsters and looked at the place. Nobody stopped me. Whereas the thing you can see at the top, which is what deals with the internet, nobody can get in there and they have detection, motion detection and all kinds of uh, security. So this is Bad Eibling here in, in Germany where uh, they do their, their, their cable uh, the processing, well, you still have these things, but they're sort of kind of like a prop almost nowadays. This, this, it's still important, the, the, the satellite stuff, but it's maybe five to 10% of what they're doing now. Um, here's some more slides. I love this one. This is just another testament to how great they are at graphic design. Uh, this is one of these accesses that got shut down. Another thing you find in these documents is, is that there's often different versions depending on the classification and who is seeing the presentation that, that they were giving. So this is a sort of more public facing one where they talk about how the partners such as Germany and Denmark, uh, you know, we can look for stuff about them on the cables uh, and they can look for stuff about us. And then there's another document somewhere else that says, but there are exceptions. Now, how are we to understand that? And, and as we've seen, the, 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 the deals apparently aren't uh, always that clear cut. This uh, story took nine months, was published in collaboration with The Intercept. Uh, and it also fit into another story by, the, by Spiegel that talked about this access that had been shut down in, in Germany, uh, Warp Drive it was called. This is actually like a tiny, tiny, tiny operation that uh, I never really saw any traces of you know, actually producing any kind of real information. And the, the, the uh, Untersuchungsausschuss, the, the German parliamentary committee has focused a lot about another small, small thing called Iconal or Iconol, which is also sort of a small blip in, in this that I never saw any sort of real you know, evidence that this was important. It, it almost seems like a sort of distraction. Um, but uh, we could at least 
confirm that Germany was a partner in this uh, big collaboration here. Here's a document uh, from the German, from sorry, from the Austrian Greens, uh, and uh, they published uh, some documents and uh, transcribed some of the process. Where Telekom, which is the the, the German uh, one of the, the the partner behind one of these uh, cable taps in Germany, uh, talks about this splitter that is basically the same way of doing it like we saw with AT&T back in 2006. Um, TIG lead, they call it. Here's a graphical representation of how that small operation that was shut down looks. Here's the building, uh, the actual split uh, and cable tap happened in, in Frankfurt Nied, Oeserstraße 111. Um, and so I didn't actually go there. What I did do was that I went and checked out. Often the, you would suspect the old state monopoly providers to be the partners. I haven't been able to prove it, but I did get access to the core side of the Danish Tele Denmark. Uh, they don't know that, but now I'm showing these pictures for the first time. I can't say how I got in there, but this is the basement below this facility where you have all the old uh, cable infrastructure from these sort of old telephone switches. Uh, and a lot of cables, here are the old uh, telephone switches, these old uh, equipment, wonderful place. Here's the internet room, um, which is where the, 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 the wavelength gear, the, the optical gear, uh, Mark can probably correct me, uh, but this is where the actual uh, important stuff happens. And I even got into the cable vault below, where, which is where all the big cables sort of are joined in these black um, sort of uh, fusing uh, houses. Um, and in some place, I can't tell you exactly where, there was a, even a, a room that looked like room 641A in, to, in that cables were going through a, a sort of a new wall. And uh, I kept this picture for a long time and finally decided to call the number on the door. And I can't actually have promised not to tell what's going on in there. Apparently, it's not what I think, but there was something really interesting in there that caused someone to call my editor-in-chief very quickly and totally freak out. Uh, in this basement, there was also a room that uh, was called the NKPX room. I, don't, I haven't had time to investigate this yet, so, so you're welcome to do so. There was also, inside Tele Denmark, a police group had their sort of mailbox. I don't know what they're doing there. Um, but what we did conclude in our story about this third-party collaboration was that the focus on individual countries you know, is actually not so important when you look at the fact that they can say, if you're tapping a cable that just crosses our territory, we're not doing anything illegal, um, but if you have all the different accesses, you can tap the country from your neighboring country. So if you're going for uh, German traffic and there's a cable passing through Denmark, and if you have a collaboration with Denmark, you're not breaking any deals or laws by tapping the German traffic in Denmark and vice versa. Again, this is just a theory that Snowden brought up when he testified to the European Parliament, but I think this is an important thing that, you know, there's a lot of focus on a place in Germany, but actually the important place in Germany might as well be in Denmark, France, or the US. Next place, the next story is in the UK, in Cornwall. I'm going back to the story that, that um, slightly pissed me off, because I really wanted to publish the documentation about uh, this uh, British cable operation. Um, now, I have a, a lot of respect for my colleagues there, and they were kind enough to invite me back in, and when they did this first story, um, this was right after Guardian had decided to destroy their own hard drives and censor themselves. I, I still think this is a, a terrible moment in their otherwise, you know, pretty brave for a UK media coverage of the Snowden documents, but they basically decided to fold right at the point they were going to publish the story about the cables in the UK and the partners. And, uh, and I also wanted to find out about my cable, the TAT14. And so I started looking for this document. Uh, the British are a lot less careful than the NSA. So there was actually this document in there in the British uh, intelligence archive. Um, here's, this has never been, seen, uh, been shown before. This is the actual document. Uh, it's called Where We Are and Where We Want to Be. Um, and it's basically just saying, it's very highly classified, but for some reason someone forgot to remove this document from the wiki and it made it very easy to basically compare this cable, this place, this company, and then guess the code names. It took a few seconds. What's also really funny about this one, and, and fantastic operational security by the GCHQ, is that there is this uh, segment of it called where we want to be. You can see how many cables they want to tap, but you can't see the names of the cables. And at some point, this is like one of the great librarian joys of my life. At some point, I sort of discovered, oh, if you, if you mark the text and change the font color <laughs> to black, all the cables are in there. Uh, so this was like, yay. Um, 
and I'm sure that poor person uh, has had a, a hard time afterwards at the GCHQ. So, um, with Süddeutsche Zeitung, NDR, VDR, and Channel 4 in the UK, uh, we decided to uh, do a story about it, and uh, this was focusing on Vodafone, which is just like the AT&T and, and, and Telekom in, 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 in Germany, is this sort of like old buddy of the intelligence service, and uh, the most uh, keen partner of the GCHQ. Um, and I've been talking a lot now, so I'm just gonna show you a bit more video, uh, but just to set, set this up, the cable list uh, and uh, the document sort of describes how they have access to basically all cables going into the UK and can sort of plug between them which ones they wanna, wanna tap. And um, a lot of these cables, as Trevor said, uh, uh, come in in Cornwall, south of England. It's easy to forget, but the internet is physical. There's a cable running off this beach connecting the British internet to the Middle East and beyond. Now by 2007, GCHQ realized there was so much traffic flowing through places like this that they didn't have the capability to collect it all. So they came up with a plan called Mastering the Internet, whereby private companies would collect it for them. And they focused on one private company in particular. Cable and Wireless had been running cables off this beach since 1870. Leaked documents show GCHQ targeted the company, even describing it as a partner. They gave it the code name Gerontic and developed links that would allow the data... I'm just going to skip forward because I'm being told that we don't have that much time. It's easy uh, to forget. Well, but here's the TAT14 station in, in Cornwall. Here's my bicycle in front of one of the other cables. Here is the surf shop. I decided to go surfing instead of looking for cables and I happened to be on top of the cable because the surf shop is actually on the cable. Here's a, here's a, a hidden cable station, uh, also White Sands. Uh, and, and the place that I found particularly interesting here is this place called Stew Jags Barn. Uh, Stew Jags Farm or Barn, uh, depending on who you ask. Um, I was staying in this bed and breakfast and, and the woman who hosted me had grown up there and told me about how this was sort of the wildest place, kind of like the back hind of, of South England in her uh, young years where you would have sex and smoke weed and everything was fantastic. Um, and, and it was even called screw jacks and not screw jacks because it sort of had this, this, this sort of rumor of being a wild place. Now this place uh, sort of withered after the 70s and in I think 91 the owner sold it to Reliance, uh, an Indian telecom, uh, what later became Reliance and it became one of the most important cable uh, hubs for uh, a sort of global cable system called the FEA. Uh, here is the uh, and, and, and just to quickly sum up, the, the story then is that the GCHQ, uh, they don't have access to this Indian company, so they hacked it and used their partnership with Vodafone to still get the data they needed uh, out of this, this cable system. Um, here's the catalog from the, the Screwjacks, from Screwjacks uh, from the 70s. I just, I just love this, I had to show it to you. Um, and it's really funny, like you go around looking for cables and you're always sort of ending up with surf and there's something about this surfing the internet and, and these places, I don't know. Um, and the story also showed that, you know, they will get access if you don't collaborate. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's an interesting position there in these companies. You collaborate or you get hacked, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. The last story I'm going to get into was the one that, that Glenn was trying to figure out. Um, I, I, I can tease Glenn because he won a Pulitzer and I spent about a thousand times as much time on this story as he did. Um, and I'm really happy that he let me work on it. Um, but this story ended up in the New York Times. Uh, I did in collaboration with ProPublica. And uh, it's really impressive, impressive to see when New York Times actually really get behind you what they can do. It was covered in, I think, 840 different uh, media around the world. Uh, someone sent me a text that it was on the displays in, in, in Schönefeld uh, here in Berlin when, when he landed. It was, it was just really um, nice. Um, but here's my colleague from ProPublica, Jeff, uh, telling you basically the, the, the crux of this story. Jeff, let's start with you. Explain what you found in the Snowden documents. So what we found is we found a partnership between AT&T and NSA that was extremely close, highly collaborative, and characterized by the uh, partner, AT&T's, extreme willingness to help. And <clears throat> they provide the NSA with large amounts of data, not only foreign to foreign, foreign also, but also foreign to domestic, and purely domestic data, including cell phone records. 
Explain why U.S. companies and the cables that they lay are so significant all over the world. It's well, not just a U.S. operation. Right, exactly. So the Internet is largely operated through the U.S., right? So it's all of the infrastructure is in the U.S. So an email that maybe is going from France to Germany has a good chance of traversing the United States. And this is where AT&T comes in. AT&T operates big, fat pipes that make up the Internet. And what AT&T gave the NSA was access to what they call their common backbone. So the, the, actually the, the story that I like the best, we did both the sort of New York Times and ProPublica real journalism story, but I actually find the story about how we did this story more interesting. Uh, we sort of go through our evidence. I'm just going to quickly skim through it. We found some words that uh, AT&T uses about their network uh, in the NSA uh, documents. Uh, SNRC is the AT&T term for a POP, which is the point of presence on the network. That's like where they peer with other uh, big internet providers. Uh, we found that in there. They had eight of, eight of them. We also find, found the common backbone that I've mentioned in this Noden archive. And uh, if you look at a map, the one that Trevor mentioned, of this Fairview AT&T NSA program, there are, if you clean it up, eight points where they tap these SNRCs, the, the pubs. I've cleaned it up here and then compared it to a 2009 AT&T map, which is below, and it turns out these eight locations, of which one of them, by the way, is San Francisco, where Mark Klein found the the secret room in 2003, well, they fit. Um, but this didn't seem enough to us, so actually the best piece of evidence, uh, which I found 12 months before, uh, was a cable cut. What had happened was that during the Tokushima earthquake, one of the uh, cables that crosses uh, the Japan-US cable had been uh, severed, had been cut, and so uh, on the day that uh, NSA reports that one of their collection points had started operating again, well, that happened to be the exact same day that that uh, cable had been uh, fixed and, and started to work again. And this was the sort of clearest, uh, you know, I had to go there, of course, but this was the clearest sign because this cable ends no other place than in an AT&T building. And so I drove up there from San Francisco, uh, and there are these wonderful uh, uh, scribbles on the, the, the road on the way up there to Point Arena, and the cable station here, which is a beautiful place uh, by the sea with uh, the station here in the background. And here's the other end of the cable that Moritz and I uh, visited back, in, back then. Uh, the same signs. Here's the building. I think this is the part that's the mo most interesting of the building. Uh, and here it is uh, from far. And uh, basically, this was a really satisfactory uh, story because we really had weighty arguments and clear evidence, and no one tried to argue with us, but I think when you try to take on companies like AT&T, you really need to do it this way. And, and what I actually found most satisfactory about this story was to see Mark Klein on, uh, uh, on, on uh, Democracy Now! afterwards, and I'm just going to show you that clip. These revelations, what do you think is most important for us to understand? Well, of course, I feel very vindicated. And the documents reveal um, what I was saying back in 2003. Well, actually, I came forward in 2006. But what I discovered in 2003 was that they were tying into the main internet data stream. So these documents confirm that. There's actually a paragraph in there that talks about, in September 2003, the NSA went live on the internet because of the installations at AT&T. At AT and, and so I was right about that. And that was all I had for you. Um, thank you very much for listening. I think this was really impressive. Thanks a lot. And uh, I suppose that in the public, public there are a million questions, so um, I really would like to open immediately to them. Um, I just have a question related to uh, one, uh, I just want to do one question each and then we open to the public. Uh, because I think one important aspect of your talk is also reflecting on the fact that uh, uh, the cable infra infrastructure has been more and more um, controlled now by uh, private corporations. So in the past, uh, we could say that was uh, mainly the domain of uh, the government, uh, and now it's getting uh, uh, more uh, a battle, a geopolitical battle among corporations. And recently, there was also 
an article that came out that was uh, referring to the fact that uh, Microsoft and Facebook were going also to control uh, and own some submarine cables. So I wonder if you want to comment a bit on that uh, and also uh, just one question would be what is next because you know you have so many documents now you are working with a lot of information and uh, so I really wonder if you can also say right now what is the next step uh, since uh, you are really you know investigating or really important documents so this is for Enric and then for Trevor I have a bit more uh, artistic question because uh, uh, I've been following uh, your work for a really long time and uh, uh, it's been always so fascinating to see how you deal with uh, the secret uh, uh, geography. So you were working uh, with the land and with the space and now with the sea. So I also wanted to ask you uh, what is uh, the experience that you got by working with the undersea network cable? What actually that had it added on your research on the secret uh, uh, geography and infrastructure. Thank you. Um, quick reply. First, I, I can neither confirm nor deny that I'm working on a new story which has to do with the same theme and which would likely make, I hope, Mark Klein even more happy. Um, so there might be more coming. Um, that's all I can say. Um, as for the other question about the company's role, I actually think what we've seen with the NSA surveillance is that these companies in some respect have failed, mainly because they have not built in enough redundancy, so the internet has actually become less diverse uh, because as more data needs to travel around the world, there are more need for these big investments in infrastructure, and they have not spent enough money on that so, so that there aren't that many cables. If there are more cables, it's more expensive to surveil it, and if there are more players, more companies, well, then it's going to get harder. I don't think we can ever stop the governments from doing this. I don't either think that it will help a lot if we uh, sort of uh, nationalize the internet. Uh, I, I really don't think that would help, actually. Uh, so. Uh, there's probably not that much to do, but I don't think it's a, it's a sort of uh, post-Marxist valid argument to say that it's the uh, fault of the corporations, no. And also in terms of that kind of stuff, it's like these landing sites, they're just one place where this thing is tapped. I mean, this is redundant like crazy. I mean, there's PRISM. I mean, there's many different access points. You know what I mean? So I think that that's, like, it, I think it's a mistake to think like, oh, the geography of like, internet surveillance has to do with like landing sites. Yeah, that's part of it, but there's many other aspects to it as well, as, as we've seen with other stuff. Um, in terms of the artistic stuff, I mean, for me, and this is kind of something I want to talk to you a little bit about, I mean, what's kind of exciting for me to work with this material is, is that sense of working with something that's really confusing and, and really dense and you're kind of trying to make sense of it and for me it's really like it's a little bit different than the kind of requirement that you have as a journalist I, it's, I, I feel like it's actually not my problem to tell a coherent story right? it's much more about trying to convey something about that impression uh, as you're talking you're developing a vocabulary Right, and you're saying like this kind of document, this kind of place, this kind of cable, um, and you're developing a vocabulary that describes an internet that's completely different than the vocabulary of like the cloud and like this kind of thing. Um, and I feel like that's where our work is very similar. And, and for me, like developing that vocabulary and figuring out a way to convey that to somebody else is the project which is slightly different than like making an argument or trying to tell a story that can, and, you know, it says, and therefore AT&T plus internet. For me, I can kind of suggest that visually or, or somehow. Um, but it's been really fun to, to be working underwater. I mean, it's a completely alien environment. I mean, and, and it's, uh, it's a real challenge to figure out aesthetically how to deal with that. Um, and so I did the work to get licensed as a scuba diver and things like that. But then there's this whole other problem of how do you make images, and not only how do you make images, how do you make your images, right? So, you know, you I would, had friends, actually, who were underwater photographers, and they'd say, well, you got to do this and this and this, and that's how you do underwater photography. And, like, that's, so I was like, okay, don't do that. <laughs> but then when you don't do that, then you have to develop your own language, and that's, 
that's difficult as well. But, but for me, it was more, I guess that process was, I wanted like formally, when I, I'd done a big project for many years um, tracking reconnaissance satellites in the sky and trying to track all the secret satellites in the sky and how do you photograph you know, these secret things in the sky. And for me, working with the cables was very similar to that in, 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 in the sense of, you know, really a lot of very specific kinds of research to figure out where in the world you could put yourself physically so that you would have the opportunity to see something if it's actually there, right? And um, so on the first boat trip, I think the boat captain said, okay, so you guys are searching like a two square mile radius to look at some, find something about that big that may or may not be on the bottom of the ocean. Like, good luck with that. <laughs> You're paying my bill either way. But, um, that, but that's kind of what it is. And that's, a, that's uh, one of the things that, that for me is kind of fun about the job. But to come about, back to the thing about the work that you've been doing, Henrik, is for me personally, what's fascinating in talking to you and working with you is like that, that montage of bits of information that you're trying to put together as a collage and there's something compelling about all the places that that doesn't make sense and you're kind of like trying to find these aha moments of like how does, you know, how does this thing fit and like oh this color in this slide is the same as the color on that slide and I know this color on this slide means this and so. Um, is there a tension, I feel like there's a tension within you of like that's the, actually the story that I feel like you want to tell and then I feel like there's a way like when you package it into like a New York Times thing that kind of kills that in a way. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. It's, it's kind of funny because um, I think with you, is this on? Yep. I think with you, there, there's the same thing, like you actually have your facts straight, you do your research and you're a very meticulous, orderly person, not just the ones that are like we see all the action stuff, but you actually do your research and I think I have the same thing. I actually really feel satisfied when the stuff matches. But I also, and it's one of the reasons why I'm happy to be here, I also really like the other stuff. So, for example, if you go to the other side of the TAT-14 cable from Germany, you get to this place called uh, Tuckerton, and there's this building there, which when you look at it the first time on Google Maps, you see, oh, that looks pretty normal, and then you flip it 3D, and you see, whoa, it's a prop, it's like a, it's a fake. And I was like, yes, this is a great story. And it turns out then when you go there and talk to the neighbors, that's because the building was there before the other zoning, the other houses around it. So they made it to look like the other buildings. There's actually nothing funny about that. And, and so those moments are also great. And they're just, they kind of disappear. Uh, and, and I think one of the reasons why I love working with Laura is that I think we both don't really fit into the traditional news media mold in that the, the straight story is often not the most efficient or, 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 or um, useful way to get information to people. On the other hand, it needs to be done. Like AT&T would never be held to account, uh, to account for what they're doing, or the case that um, Mark Klein's involved in wouldn't move forward if we didn't get this out. So yes, there is that tension. And, and I think I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to sort of try and, and do both. Uh, so now I'm working on a visual project, uh, sort of the same stuff, but, but I, I, I try to sort of play both instruments, just like you do, I guess. Thank you. So now I will open the question to the public. <coughs> Who wants to be first? <laughs> yes. No? Yep. Now it's working. Okay, thanks a lot for the great talks. You mentioned a little bit the relationship between the corporations and the government. And I think that still remains very vague to me. So, so the, the relationship between the governments and the corporations is, is a vague thing. Um, do you want me to explain a bit more about it? Uh -huh. Yes, I think I would like you to elaborate a bit more because what's, I mean, it's clearly started as a war on terror. The, the NSA wants to collect data to survey. What is the interest or how did they motivate or how did the private corporations come on board? What's the deal between them? Because they both have access to the data. What is the interest of AT&T, for example? What, because it's a in, different interest. 
what's the deal? Is this voluntary? Because at one mm. point you said if they don't collaborate, they hack. But is there also money involved, for example? Are they getting paid from the government for doing this? Yes. No, um, AT&T, for example, that, that relationship started early in the 70s and, and is pre-internet. And I think a lot of these are sort of in the gray area. So there are lawful methods to get them to collaborate. You have, you know, uh, pretty clear actually infrastructure, for example, in, in, in the US for lawful interception. But then you have these companies that are sort of almost a branch of the government, such as AT&T, where they really seem to be doing a lot more than they need to do and sort of research and development. And it's, it seems like even a, a, a sort of income stream for them, the same with, with cable and wireless that became Verizon. And I think one of the problems we have is that we don't really have an insight. So actually there's a really, really nerdy story about Team Telecom, which is this part of, um, it's sort of a way to pressure companies to collaborate with the NSA that sort of was used to get the, 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 the contracts in place after 9-11. And, and one of the mechanisms they have is that they say, um, if you want to land a, a cable on the US, we have to get access to it. And if the company starts being difficult, they just don't get the license. Now, you could call that extortion, but as long as it doesn't happen directly and clearly, you just, for some reason, it's taking to get a license while this other company gets it in a week. Well, I think that's one of the mechanisms. And, and, and as a telecom, do you want to do business or do you want to be defending some ideal in a space where nobody will know about it because it's all classified, right? It's a difficult position they're in, not, that, not to sort of speak too much the case, but I do uh, see that th it's difficult from their perspective. I think one of the things that we need are more people like Mark Klein who come forward and who talk about when that collaboration then goes too far, when they're asked to do stuff that they don't want to do. I also totally believe that there is a need for these companies to, to collaborate with law enforcement uh, so that we can uh, you know, prevent as much as we can. The problem is where do we draw the line? I think that's like really, I mean, these are old collaborations. I mean, especially at the AT&T level. I mean, you, I don't think about AT&T as like a private company in the same that way that like Reebok or something like this. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's more like, like a Lockheed Martin or an Airbus or something like that, where it's doing critical infrastructure. I mean, it still is a private company, but the state is a huge customer of it. I mean, it's very, and, and I think that's like, and those collaborations with AT&T and the, you know, you know, even like Western Union, these sort of are from the get-go. They were, those were collaborative uh, structures with intelligence agencies. What's kind of interesting that you see, I think, with the, some of the post and stuff is that there's a shift, you know, but the Googles are not, don't have that same history. And, and we're actually not started as a branch of the state in a way that like an AT&T or a Lockheed Martin were. You know, and I think, I think that's kind of one of the tensions that you're seeing now where, you know, some of the, the companies like a Google or a Yahoo will be more, you know, interested in fighting or an Apple would, 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 would push back against the state much more than the companies that actually own the backbone, like the, the and, and in fairness, there's actually, they, they do that. We just don't hear about it. And I think actually one of the, the most misreported stories, unfortunately, is the PRISM story about the collaboration between these companies and the NSA, because it's not everything. It's, it's, it's very strictly uh, regulated and it's fairly targeted. Uh, and I, I don't like that kind of reporting where you make it seem like they're getting everything. They will listen to you. You know, I, that doesn't help anybody. So I would actually like to go back and revisit PRISM and, and find sources inside these companies who can talk about it. Google was pissed off because they were like, this is not what we're doing. And they said that very early on. And I think there's something about that. Unfortunately, I don't know. Like, it would take a lot of time and, and there's so many stories still to be made. But I think that's an important one. And I think they should also be more proactive in telling their part of the equation, even though they might break the law. So uh, other questions? Over there. Hi there. Um, I had a question about uh, something you brought up in terms of the um, availability of these cables, uh, you know, for potential, I think you mentioned potential terrorist attacks or just potentially screwing things up really bad if they got cut. Is there um, a possibility that these are being uh, intervened upon by other actors outside of the Five Eyes groups. And the point I'm trying to get at here is, is this intelligence being democratized in a sense by the fact that these cables are vulnerable to interception across a very large route? 
I think it's a good question, and I think one of the things that, that motivates me is that, yes, probably it is going on. The, the thing that's really key here is that there's a huge asynchronicity in the fact, or it's, 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 it's not even because the U.S. controls 95% of the inf infrastructure, and even though you might set up a cable tab in India, uh, you, you will not get an email from, from Germany to Austria, which you will get perhaps in the U.S. And so uh, I, it's, it's, it's a real problem that there is this, they just have much better ears, and they will do. I think what we've seen is that the other intelligence agencies become much better at targeted surveillance and human, so the, the, the human sources, because they don't have that, and if the U.S. stays sort of in this realm of trying to find a technical fix for their problems uh, and all this big data we're going to get you, then, then I think that, that that evens out a bit. But I find it's a real problem, and what I've been trying to show is that when you get these table ca cable taps, you can also l use them to you know, rig the, the Security Council vote by knowing what everybody else is going to vote. You can change the outcome of climate negotiations. You can do a lot of conventional spying because you needed to do this for terrorism. And I think it's a real dilemma, and I think there's more to be said about it. Uh, on the other hand, I, 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 I refuse to believe that there, it's some kind of uh, big scheme to sort of world domination. I think it's just what happens, sort of mission creep. The thing is that the U.S. is just willing to spend a lot more money doing this than anybody else. I mean, I think that was one of the big revelations from the Snowden archive, was that there, there was no magic in there. Like, every attack, every hack, every tap was stuff that people in the security community had theorized and said, well, this would be one way that you could attack this kind of architecture. This would be an, a hardware kind of attack. It would be a software thing. But nobody imagined that you would actually have the gumption and spend the money to deploy those kind of attacks on a global scale. And I think that was like the failure of imagination from people outside the NSA who were, were just like, yeah, sure, you could theoretically do this, but who would, it would be unbelievably expensive and you would have to really have a sense of impunity to do that. And it turns out that, that both of those were true. And sort of the new thing is cyber, right? So, so that's the new excuse to spend a lot of money and get access. And, and you even see in the documents that, you know, this is also used to get funding for newer projects. So I, I was going to show you documents about the Nidana Beach uh, cable station and the Hillsborough ca cable station on the Trans-Pacific Express cable, which is sort of the, the cyber war front now, which is a Verizon uh, location that we also exposed, which is so weird that this uh, totally normal cable station is now the attack platform and sort of the the ballistic missile similar in the internet age, but that's how it is. And, and I, I, I think that there's a lot more reporting to be done about this, but it's difficult. And without sources like Snowden, it's, it's impossible to cover. Um, we are a bit over time, but we started a bit later, so I would say let's still use five minutes for two really quick questions. One over there. This is a question about the cables and the ownership, and I don't know um, if that's going to come up later in the conference, but I've heard conflicting reports about um, the U.S. ownership of cables, and um, I've heard recent reports where claims are made that the U.S. doesn't have access to that many cables. So I don't know if either one of you has a sense of the division of who owns the cables of the internet in terms of countries? Not access, but who, who owns them, basically. So, so the short answer to this, if you look at, for example, the TAT14, just coincidentally one of my favorite cables, um, that is owned by a, a consortium of companies where they have shares. So the cable system costs a couple of billion dollars, and each company, depending on their share and, and their infrastructural role, pays... Uh, Maybe, Mark, you can talk a little bit more about this, but it's basically, you can't do this on your own. Few of them are controlled by one company alone, but some are, and, and especially the, the, the long, expensive ones are the ones where they need a lot of power, and, and they uh, are often con uh, consortiums. And I think it's fair to say that, this is a total guesstimate, but I would say maybe 50% are uh, on US, UK hands, uh, maybe more. There's a big company called Tata, for example, that isn't, uh, wholly, wholly owned by um, Anglo-Saxon, but, but there's, there's, there's definitely um, still a, a large way towards that. Yes, do you want to shout? Ah, okay. No. 
It's a very pragmatical question. If you um, any uh, ideas on the time factor on the workflow of the NSA, is it a question of seconds when they tap a cable to have the inform a specific information on the desk, or is it minutes, or is it days? Because there's also humans involved in it who have only shifts and maybe end work. Some estimations or informations about that. I mean, I can only say what I've seen in the documents, and it depends on the sort of setup they have with each of their partners. Um, some, the tasking process, which is loading the, 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 the sort of target, so if you were to target your email into the system, some partners have up to a week, even more delay before they get it. It's not, it doesn't seem like a real time, sort of like minority report, you're sort of listening to the conversation as that happens, no. But I think what we see in the archive is that they're moving closer and closer to that wet dream of intelligence that you can sort of uh, follow stuff real time. But it really depends on how, careful and, and how protected the, the collaboration is and how much they get access. So with AT&T, we showed that they have their own equipment inside AT&T and they have boxes and, 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 and can use them. And I think some stuff probably is closer to real time, but it's still hard to sort of say for sure. Uh, and, and it's probably, there's also a lot of technical problems often. And I think one of the things we should be careful doing is to overestimate the, the, what they can do. A lot of these are sort of sales pitches to other government bodies or their own divisions and sort of trying to, to uh, make it look better than it actually is. That's right, and uh, but with the caveat that the Snowden Archive is from 2013, which may have well have been from 1813 at this point, you know, in terms of internet time and the scale that they're doing. Okay, so I would say Let's uh, close it here. We will go on also with the other great presentation. And thank you very much, Trevor Pegling and Henry Bolke. Thank you.